the early hour. I wonder if going to 6.30 was that wise. We've had fewer people since we did that. But uh, I'm told that it's hard to get through the streets of Charleston today with all the rain. Uh, I live nearby, so it wasn't bad for me, but people don't come if they have to go through the rain. Miserable cowards clinging to life. <laughs> Suppose Noah had said that. It's raining. I'm not going to build an ark. It's raining. The story of Jacob is so neatly told. These Bible writers in Old and New Testament are not just recorders of what happened or didn't. I mean, we don't know. Did these things happen? Didn't they? Who knows after thousands of years? This is almost 4,000 years ago. But they're great stories, and they tell great lessons to us, but they're also fascinating for telling us about living conditions in those days. But they're not the usual kind of history. We don't know what the basis of them is, what happened or didn't happen. They are constructed with models in mind. Look how neatly he has constructed the story of, of Jacob. First, Jacob at home cheats his brother out of his birthright, misleads his father, lies to his father, and passes himself off as his older brother. It's a hard time for younger brothers. Pro, t- a primogenitor, the eldest son, gets everything. Jacob didn't want to leave it at that. And God had actually told his mother that the younger would rule the older. So she cooperates with Jacob uh, and brings about God's will. Should we just sit around waiting for God to do what he wants to do? Or if God's... Jack Kennedy said in his inauguration, here on earth God's will has to be... God's work has to be ours. And if the kingdom of God is going to be built, it has to be built with human hands. So what Rebecca did in abetting a lie to old blind Isaac, not a nice thing to do, but necessary. The women, as usual, do the necessary work to advance God's purposes. Very interesting sub-theme in the Bible, often not noticed because it's so patriarchal and God seems to be masculine, whatever that means. And the men run everything. But right under the surface, it's the women who make the crucial decisions. In how many households is that the case? But it's certainly the case here. It's very interesting. So Rebecca does what has to be done. And we have this very interesting family story of Jacob and his brother and his father. That's the first part of his story. Then he has to flee. We're given various reasons for that. The J. Ryder says fleeing the wrath of, wrath of the righteous wrath of his brother, who was justly annoyed at him. And the other writers, the P writer says, no, it was in order to get, or the E writer, in order to get the proper kind of wife back home at Abraham's hometown. Either way, he left. And then he had the, the famous stairway or ladder dream. And this nasty little kid who spent his life looking for the main chance trying to get ahead, pushing everybody else aside, finds God, or rather, God finds him. He has a dream. You know, Freud said a dream is an unfulfilled wish. He must have wanted, maybe he's lost, look at it this way, if you want to be Freudian about it, he's lost his father because he treated him so badly. He doesn't think he'll ever see his father again, so he wants another father, God. For many people, God is a sort of ideal father. All the failings that our real fathers have, God is perfect. He doesn't do those things. Well, in the Bible, he does a lot of questionable things, but the way people think of God now is he's the ideal projection of a father. So Jacob finds that father after, in a sense, he's lost Isaac because of how he treated him. And anyway, he's hundreds of miles away. God finds him And he realizes at the end of that dream, with angels going up and down a ladder, and God on the top of the ladder, and he here, so the connectedness, the relationship between God and man is vivid. And some ways of reading the Hebrew has God standing on the earth right next to Jacob. It says he was alecha, he was over him. Does that mean he was standing over this 
man who was lying down sleeping, or he was on top of the staircase. We don't know. But either way, he wakes up and he says, wow, that's not in there, but that's what he said. The Lord was in this place, in this world, all the time, and I, I didn't notice. I was so busy running around and getting ahead, I didn't notice that spirituality permeates the world, that meaning permeates the world. That's what it is to recognize God in the world. Life is supposed to mean something. It's supposed to be about something. It's not just running errands and keeping appointments. A lot of people don't know that. They never even raise the issue of meaning. That's the great issue of philosophy, of literature, of religion. What does it mean? Why am I here? What am I to do while I'm here? And religion is created to give an answer to that. And he discovers that there's meaning to life. It's not just scrounging to get ahead. What a revelation. He'll never be the same. The two life-changing events in Jacob's life are either a dream, the staircase, or his wrestling, which we'll get to in a minute, which is dream-like, even if it isn't presented exactly as a dream. And sandwiched between those two things, you have the latter dream and you have the wrestling sort of dream. And in between is that pastoral tale of the life in Laban's sheep... Uh, whatever you would call that, sheep farm. And old Laban tries to cheat him. Jacob does him one better and has children with two women, sisters, and two maids, and has a big family now, ten sons and a daughter. And he's rich, very rich. God has been with him, which means, of course, in that society, he has lots of sheep and lots of cattle. And he's now, he breaks with Laban after 20 years, and he's going home. And now we have the other side of the sandwich. Dream image, pastoral 20 years, another dream, and then we'll be back home with Jacob, which balances the first part of his life when he was home but how different this will be. He'll make up with Esau. Esau and Jacob will together bury their father Isaac. Isaac was worried about dying 20 years earlier. He's still around. Like my uncle Freddie, he was dying of, uh, of the same heart problem for 35 years. Very healthy, but constantly discussing <laughs> that he was about to drop dead. He lived to 90 something. All right, here we, here we have what I think is the most profound story, perhaps, in the Bible. One of the most profound. It's hard to say. See, these are all such literary and spiritual gems. Chapter 32, verses 24 to 32. Powerful, powerful story. Jacob is afraid, is terrified of what Esau will do. He sinned against Esau twice, and he's conscious of it. It's like, why are we more conscious of the war between the states here in the South than they are in the North? Because they won. When you lose a war, there's an unfinished agenda. And if you think you've done something wrong and violated your own moral code, Jacob now has a moral code. God has discovered him. He knows his early life was rotten. And so there's an unfinished agenda. And he feels, well, Esau must feel as angry at me as I am ashamed before him for what I did. Maybe he'll kill me. He may have been having a bloodlust for me for the last 20 years. And so the night before he meets Esau, he wrestles with some mysterious character in a dreamlike sequence at night a character that has to leave with the rising of the sun, a mysterious creature of the night. Who is it? What is it? That's what this, the ambiguity is all about. When the Bible is ambiguous, it wants to be ambiguous. It wants to say something clear, it says it. This is a very ambiguous thing, the way a dream is. I had some vivid dreams last night, and I woke up, and you try to figure out what was going on, 
very complicated. You have to decode it. And without a good psychoanalyst, which I don't have to have it, happen to have at the moment, it's very difficult to figure out what all these symbols mean. Because you, there are very few words in the dream. It's all pictures. We're artists. The minute we fall asleep and close our eyes, we become artists and create these great canvases. But who knows what they mean? You need an expert to decode it. All right, he's anticipating meeting his brother. He's terrified. And so what would he dream about? He'd dream about a wrestling match with another man, which is what he thinks will happen the next day. He divides his camp a little bit before and then afterwards to protect the other people. Fearing Esau, this man is a changed man. He's worried about his wives. He's worried about his children. He's going to go and meet Esau very bravely. But he thinks about other people. He didn't used to do that. He's a changed man. God breaking into your life, that's, what, that's the message he brings. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, which is exactly what the Pope quoted before the Congress today. So he's learned that. And now he has the dream. And look how complex it is. He puts, puts his wives across a stream so they'll be safe on the other side of the water. And verse 24 of chapter 32, Jacob was left alone. This is, of course, the J writer, who is the greatest of all the great writers in the Bible, the greatest in terms of internal psychology. Jacob was left alone. Let me just, I'll read it, and then we'll go back and pull it apart. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and Jacob's thigh was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then the man said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. Whoever this is, he's got to disappear before the sun rises. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now we saw Abraham challenge God over Sodom and Gomorrah, but this is really new. If he thinks this is a divine being, he says no to him. I won't let you go. And he must be, you know, I should have brought in the statue I have at home by Willard Hirsch, who's the great Charleston sculptor of the 1930s. Jacob wrestling with the angel. It's about this big. Now there's a full-size one in some synagogue in Baltimore. That, he did the, the wooden one for them. But this was one of his, what he called doodles. A doodle is a beautiful thing. It's in black bronze. And you've got Jacob and the angel, because the angel has wings. and Grabby. You don't know whether they're making love or fighting. And Jacob, the angel has his hand around Jacob's back. And you see grooves in his back. Because when an angel grabs you, you're grabbed. And you see these grooves where his fingers have cut into Jacob's back and they're hugging each other. And Hirsch has got the, the dynamism of it. I'll, uh, if I can remember, I'll bring it next week. It's a wonderful piece. He said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, the other said to Jacob, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no more be called Jacob, but Yisrael, Israel. That means God wrestler. That's what Israel means. Everyone who wrestles with the question of meaning in life, the ultimate, what we call in philosophy, the first order questions. What the hell is the whole thing about? What am I doing here? How should I act? Everyone who wrestles with those questions doesn't just entertain them in a shallow way, but wrestles with them, body and soul, is an Israelite. That's what it means. There are Jewish Israelites, there are Christian Israelites. In Buddhism and Hinduism, there are also in Islam, there are Israelites. Anybody who does wrestles with those questions is an Israelite. So he gets a new name. Names are extremely important in the Old Testament. And New Testament too, Jesus renames many of these disciples. Your name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel. For you are striving with God and with man. The Elohim ve'anoshim. That can be read 
God or man, or God and man. And there's a big difference. Then, and you have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, tell me, I pray, your name. I told you mine. It's only fair that you tell me yours. But he said, the other said to Jacob, and I would translate the Hebrew this way, how can you ask such a question? It's translated, why is it that you ask my name? It's how can you ask after my name? And there he blessed him. Well, I would read that sentence differently too. It says, he blessed him sham. In Hebrew, the word sham means there or upon it. I think he's saying, you have asked the unanswerable question, but you're blessed for asking it, although I will not answer it. Human beings face God, and we say, are you really there? We believe you are, we think we're talking to you, but are we talking to ourselves? Tell us, please. We want to know that what we believe is true. And God says, ah, 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 that's cheating. I make room for faith. If I, would, I know the table is here. That knowledge does nothing for me. Do I know that God is here? In another way, by deep conviction and feeling. But I can't prove it. People live their whole lives for God and they know they can't even prove there is a God or that there isn't a God. It's beyond, it's something beyond such proof because you can prove things of the physical world with height and depth and width and all of that and God is not that kind of reality. Tell me your name. How can you ask such a question? But I bless you upon the question for asking it. So Jacob called the name of the place Penei El, meaning, literally in Hebrew, the face of God. In other words, this place, every place, this world is the face of God. I've quoted the poem by Edna St. Vincent Millay, quoting, commenting on Moses seeing God in the burning bush. Earth's filled with heaven, and every lowly bush is aflame with God if we have Moses' eyes to see it. It's how we see it that makes it a revelation. Other, somebody looks at the sky and says, that's pretty, and someone else says, Hashemayim the Supreme Kavodo, the heavens declare his glory. Depends on how you look. So Jacob called the name the, of the place of this world, Penael, the face of God, for I have seen God face to face and yet my life is preserved. And the sun rose upon him. Didn't just rise. The sun of understanding, of knowledge, of insight rose for him. Now what was half taught at the stairway dream, the relationship between God and man is fully taught. The intersection between God and man. God and man are like this. They're not God here and man here. That was the lesson of the stairway, but penetration of the divine and the human. That's a greater lesson. The sun rose upon him as he passed over the world, which is now Peneel, the face of God, limping because of his thigh. It was put out of joint. All right, now let's go back and analyze this incredibly complex and dense text. First of all, Jacob was left alone. So we're invited to think that he wrestled with himself. His own depth dimension. Dwell in the depth, the Bible says. Not the ego, not the consciousness, but something infinitely deeper. Freud spoke of the unconscious mind, and Jung identified that as the dwelling of God. So there is a depth dimension to ourselves. Meister Eckhart said, God is closer to me than I am to myself. That is, than my ego is to myself, my conscious mind is to myself. There's a deeper self. And T.S. Eliot called God more distant than stars, yet nearer than the eye. Heart of my heart, 
down in those depths. Jacob is wrestling with his inner self, as every man and every woman must if they're going to find God. God is not just an item in the world. Well, some people say, what do we have in this room? We have tables and chairs and people and a glass and a pitcher and God. God is an item. That's not what religion says. Religion is about the interpenetration of the human and the divine. I find God down in the depth. And as I've said a million times, that's why revelations in the Bible are either on mountaintops, more distant than stars, or in caves nearer to me than I am to myself. Jacob was left alone, so he's wrestling with himself. Religion requires that you wrestle with yourself. You come to know yourself. There are a lot of people who call themselves religious because they can recite the creed and say, I believe it. But unless they say it with a kind of inner conviction that this tells me who I am, it ain't religion. Remember the hymn, the Christmas Eve hymn, O little town of Bethlehem. It's all about Jesus being born 2,000 years ago. Very nice. Some people believe it. Some people don't. Ain't religion. Until you get to the last verse. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in me today. Christ can be born a million times in Bethlehem, 6,000 miles away. Who cares? He's got to be born here. I am the manger. I am the crib in which God comes to reality. And if I'm not, then Christmas is just a historical commemoration. It's a living experience if God comes to life in me and we grab each other the way Jacob and this other did and penetrate each other. Powerful stuff. Number one, Jacob is left alone. He wrestled with himself. The very next part of the same sentence, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. So he's wrestling with another man. You know what? It never says angel. Later in the Bible, it says, well, everyone knows Jacob wrestled with an angel, and that's what the Sunday school teachers tell us. Religion may or may not survive Sunday school teachers. It doesn't, it doesn't say angel. If it wanted to say angel, it would say it. It says a man, it says himself, then a man, and then other things. But angel is one thing, even though I have that beautiful sculpture, that's not what the Bible says. That would be too explicit. This is a dream image, we're not sure what it means. It, we try to grab it, it sort of flows through our fingers. A man wrestled with him. Well, that means that the religious encounter has got to involve not just the depth of myself, but the depth of myself confronting the depth of other people. Religion is always love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. And so I have to, my religion has a great deal to do essentially with how I treat you and you and you and you. I can't mistreat you and praise God and be close to God. Impossible. Because you are the images of God. It's much easier to find God in some heavenly projection than to find God in the face of the people around you. We often don't like them, we fight with them. But if you don't see the image of God in the person next to you, look again. It's worth a lifetime of looking. Moses had to look very hard to see God in that bush. And to see God in the human being, very difficult. But that's our task. So a man wrestled with him interpersonal relationships of the greatest depth, that's part. Kindness, compassion, struggle, that's part of our relationship with God. I had a friend, I have a friend, who married a woman in college, and she had a, a, little, a little brother. And at the time, I was a very intense Republican, and he was a socialist, God knows a Marxist, and he fled to uh, Canada to uh, avoid the draft during Vietnam and all that. And I would fight with him. He would pick fights with me and I would pick fights with him. And his sister, my friend's wife said, stop fighting with Danny. And I said, don't you understand by fighting with him, I'm taking him seriously. 
No one takes him seriously. He has views. He knows my views are opposite. And by confronting him, I'm saying he's worth talking to and his opinions are worthwhile. I'm trying to refute them. I'm doing him the biggest favor I can. And I'm doing it because he's so ignored. And I don't know what effect it had, but that was my intention. So sometimes we struggle with the other, the way Jacob does here. You're doing him a favor. You're complimenting him. You're taking him seriously to take time to argue with him if you happen to disagree. When the man saw, so here it's a man again. So Jacob is wrestling with himself. He's wrestling with another man, a human being. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob. See, it, it doesn't tell us he fell asleep and had a dream the way it did with the ladder or the staircase. It, it's possible a man just came along and had a fight with him. We're invited to consider that. Of course, much more is going on. The man saw he did not prevail against Jacob. They're evenly matched. He touched the hollow of his thigh. If this is God, are God and man even, evenly matched? God creates us human beings as the kind of being who to be human has to create God. In other words, I've said this before, the creator creates the creation. God creates us, true. The poet creates the poem. The painter creates the painting. But the poem creates the poet. And the painting creates the painter. Because if you don't have a painting you've painted, you're not a painter. And if you don't have a poem you've written, you're not a poet. I once said this to my father at a very overwrought moment. He didn't appreciate it. You're my son. You'll do what I say. I'm your father. I said, who made you a father? Me. You made me your son. I made you my father. And you needed a woman's help to do that. I don't need anyone's help to make you my father. So you created me. I created you. You like being a father? You should appreciate what I've done for you. He hit me. <laughs> hit me with a fork in the back of my hand. So he said, for this you go to college. Uh, but it's true. The creator creates the creation and the creation creates the creator. Meaning, if, ma if there were no species on earth that recognized God, and that's the human species, if we didn't exist, in what sense would God exist? In the Talmud, which is this great compendium of Jewish commentaries on the Bible, God says, he's quoted, in the Bible he says to Israel, you are my witnesses. And the rabbis comment in the Talmud, if you are my witnesses, I am God. And if you are not my witnesses, I am, as it were, not God. They save themselves with the as of were, as it were, so it's still an orthodox statement. But in some sense, without human beings to praise him and acknowledge him and argue with him and recognize him, would God be God? He wouldn't be a creator without a creation. He wouldn't be the lover of mankind. In the Russian church, they all say God is the lover of souls. If there were no souls, if there were no people to love, he couldn't be the redeemer of the world if there were no world to redeem. He couldn't be the sustainer of the world if there were no world to sustain. So the titles we use for God, except God itself, which I don't know, that just means the infinite and the eternal one, period, the end. And everything else we say about God is relational. It describes his relation to us. No us, no relationship. Therefore, none of the attributes of God would hold, except to say God is just the eternal and infinite one. But we want more from God. We want God to love us. We want God to care about us, to be just and compassionate and grace, give us grace and all that. And that's all relational. So he makes us human and we make him divine. It's an even trade. So here we have a man wrestling with someone, and he will conclude at the end of this that I've wrestled with God. If it's true that this is God, he can prevail over Jacob, and Jacob can prevail over him. They seem to be evenly matched. Again, this mutual dependency of God and man. Let me go. Oh, not yet. The man saw he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh, 
and Jacob's thigh was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. When you wrestle with ultimacy, you're crippled. Something happens. You're never the same. The prophet, is it, which prophet is it? Hosea, I think, says, the way of man is not in himself. Man, you know the hymn, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. A religious person feels that he's leaning, lean on Jesus, lean on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarm, great hymn. If you, by the way, if you haven't seen the movie, Night of the Hunter, with Robert Mitchum and Shelley Winters, the only movie ever directed by Charles Lawton. In this movie, Robert Mitchum is a, a preacher who's really a mass murderer. And as he goes from murder to murder, he rides on his horse singing, leaning on the everlasting arms. It's the only movie ever directed by the great, the immortal Charles Lawton. Get it. Get the DVD and watch it in your home. It's my favorite movie and I think it has a dreamlike biblical quality that you'll never forget. It's magnificent, perfect movie. And Leaning on the Everlasting Arms is the hymn of the movie because it so contradicts the evil of this terrible man. In the beginning, the first line of the movie is, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, for in, inwardly they are ravenous wolves. And then we see this terrible story. But what a magnificent piece of, of art this movie is. Like the Bible, very similar, very biblical. Night of the Hunter, mid-50s, unforgettable. All right, so we lean on God. Without him, we're crippled. Compared to God, we are cripples. And when you confront ultimacy, there's a price to be paid. You recognize your dependence on God, and crippling is a kind of recognition of dependence. You limp. And Jacob famously will limp for the rest of his life. And then he said, well, we go, the name has been changed. Jacob has been changed to Israel, meaning you're striving with God or man or God and man, and it's not clear which it is. If it's God or man, Elohim va'anashim in Hebrew, ve can mean or or and. That's how vague a language Hebrew is. And if it's God or man, then this other is saying to Jacob, you decide who I am. I ain't talking. You decide. You impose meaning on this experience. It's up to you to choose the meaning. Am I God? Am I just another man? Or in some sense, am I both, since man's created in the image of God? You decide. If it's God and man, it's another way of saying to confront the divine is to confront the human, and to confront the human is to confront the 